Greeting. Greetings, this is Management 431. We are beginning Chapter 7, which is the lectures on recruiting. Um, so we've talked about sourcing, and sourcing is a big part of recruiting, but I like how our, um, the textbook writers keep it separate because sourcing and the actual role and job of recruiting are slightly different, so they do separate it nicely. Um, so we'll work through um, all of the uh, recruiting material and proceed from there. The key learning objectives for this chapter are as follows. I mean, they expect you to be able to understand the purpose of recruiting and why organizations do it and how important it is in the, big, in the bigger scheme of things. Um, you should be able to understand what it means to have a spillover effect. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, applicant reactions and how they react to the recruiting process the importance of that in the context of spillover. We need to understand what makes a recruiter more or less effective, and some recruiters are better at the job than others. Some types of positions um, are better for um, uh, certain types of personalities, um, and certain kinds of uh, recruiting uh, venues um, are served better with different kinds of recruiters. And so we'll get into some of the important characteristics of recruiters. We will talk about the various strategies that companies use to attract applicants and, and understanding that more deeply. Um, and then we'll also figure out how to create a recruiting guide, in, um, which goes in alignment with your sourcing guide, um, and uh, make sure that we are within the guidelines of the EEOC's best recruiting practices to make sure that you have consistency, but also that we stay within the, the realm of uh, treating people fairly um, and um, and also at the same time ensuring we get the best quality candidates that we can for the job. Recruitment is defined as the things that we do to take leads and that we that were generated um, about potential applicants and and convert them into actual applicants for the job. And so what we're basically doing is attracting qualified individuals to apply for a position and we source our leads as we talked about in the previous lecture but what we try to do is grab the interest of applicants that we want and try to convince them to apply for the job and to stay in the hiring process so that we can extend them an offer and ultimately hire the best person for the job so anybody can do recruiting really in the organization oftentimes it is the HR department engaged in recruiting or the hiring managers engaged in recruiting, but employees, regular employees are engaged in the recruiting process as well. And as you guys go to college, you know, your job fairs on, in, at college, you start to see different um, people who are sitting behind the tables um, for each company. And you'll notice that oftentimes they'll have regular employees who um, are, don't have any leadership in the organization or they're not in HR, they're actively engaged in the recruiting process. And so it's really important, even if you don't want to do a career in HR, that you understand the role um, that, that people in the organization play um, in helping the recruiting process happen. One of the most important factors to consider um, while we're engaged in recruiting is understanding applicant reactions. Uh, and you might seem to think, maybe you ask yourself, why do we care? Why do we care about applicant reactions? Well, if you think about it, recruiting is marketing. It's marketing 101. It's how do we brand ourselves? How do we create a message that communicates things clearly? All those sorts of things. That's basic marketing. And so recruiting also wants to make, um, to make sure that it's leaving a positive impression with the applicants so that they stay interested in the company and ultimately may apply for the job um, and, uh, and, uh, and test for it or accept an offer if it's made. So if we don't pay attention to the way that we treat people in the recruiting process and give them a positive, realistic experience about what the organization does um, and how we treat people, um, if we don't do that, um, we're going to have a hard time attracting candidates or keeping them once they um, um, are hired. Because if the message that we communicated them to them during the recruiting process is different than 
what they get when they enter the organization, that's going to be our problem. So since we said that applicant reactions are important, the biggest aspect of applicant reactions that we care about is, is a sense of fairness um, and making sure that the outcome is fair, um, that the process was fair, and that the interactions that people had um, with people in the organization, with the recruiter, with the process, that that was considered fair, that people were treated well. What do we mean by those three di different types of fairness? Well, distributive fairness is, was the outcome fair? Meaning, did you get the job? Did you get the promotion? Um, and even if I didn't get the job or promotion, do I think that the outcome was fair? Do I think that reasonably, you know, I did the best I could, I know I could not have done better, and it may be, and I'm sure it was a hard choice for them. I think that the outcome was fair. Um, the person who ended up getting the job was a significantly better candidate. Do you feel like it was fair? Now, sometimes if you are an external candidate and you don't know who they hired, it may not feel fair because you would hope that you got the job, right? But certainly when you're an internal candidate, you can determine whether or not the outcome was fair um, when it comes to two internal people um, competing for a job promotion. Um, and so, you know, if you go up against, you know, somebody who you know is incredibly talented um, and that they hired them, then, you know, sometimes if you know them well enough, you can say, yeah, that was a fair choice. I think that person's a good person. I think they'll probably do a better job, you know, for me on the job, you know. So distributive fairness is probably the one that we have the most difficult having a direct impact on. Um, for external candidates because it's hard for them to be able to assess whether or not the outcome was fair because if I don't get the job it doesn't feel fair to me. Um, but the two other factors of fairness absolutely influence those distributive fairness or distributive justice feelings. And what do I mean by that? If the process is fair, right, if I think that the procedure was managed well, that I had an opportunity to talk, there were no undue delays or people, you know, um, you know, the tests that were just really hinky and made no sense to me or if they lost my materials and we had to redo this all over again. But if all of those things went really smooth, the whole process from beginning to end was as smooth as silk, um, I feel better about that. And if I feel good about the process, then I am more likely to accept the outcome, no matter what the outcome is, good or bad for me. And the same thing with interactional justice. Interactional justice is how fair or how fairly I am treated interpersonally um, with certain types of information and certain types of interactions, how I'm treated during the hiring process. Am I treated honestly? Am I treated fairly? Were people nice to me? Did they give me a glass of water? I mean, my best experience, honestly, recruiting, being recruited for a job was here at SIUE when I applied for a job here. Um, they treated me incredibly well, and I was absolutely convinced that this is the place that I wanted to come work. And I'm here 13, 12 years later, and I was right. This was a great place to work. So when you're treated nicely in the process and you're treated kindly and fairly during the process, if people are um, kind to you interpersonally, if they are transparent with you and with them information, um, that interactional fairness in combination with procedural fairness has a very positive impact on distributive fairness. So I am far more likely to believe that the outcome was fair if the interactions and the procedures felt fair, all right? Spillover effects are the unintended consequences of how you treat somebody um, on during the recruiting and selection process. For example, um, if you make people wait, or if you lose their application materials, or if people um, show up for the interview to interview you and they're distracted and they take phone messages and they walk away, how does it make you feel? Do you feel like you're important to the company? Do you feel like they care? Very likely you will feel like you weren't treated nicely and you are less inclined to go and work for the company. 
Um, the other things to consider too are if it's a company that makes a product that you like, would you buy their product? If they didn't treat you well and they treated you rudely and they forgot you were in the conference room or you, they, they came late to, to interview you or to a meal, would you want to buy from them? So the unintended consequence of a lousy selection experience for people is that oftentimes word of mouth gets out and that can affect their ability to recruit in the future and attract new people in the future or for example if you are recruiting with a college campus words get word gets out on college campuses about which employers treat people well which employers treat people poorly and ultimately you may decide, well, why would I want to even spend my money with them? And so you might decide that I'm just not going to spend money. And then you tell two friends and they tell two friends and the story continues on about your lousy experience. And ultimately, it starts to affect the organization's reputation. So um, spillover effects are a real thing. And um, organizations do suffer when they don't treat people kindly and fairly in the selection process. Imagine now, if you, if you will, the opposite effect. You walk into an organization, they greet you by name, they, they shake your hand, they say they're happy to see you, they give you a tour of the location, they treat you kindly, they treat you fairly, they treat you with respect. Everybody's on time or early, they wine and dine you, they make sure you have everything that you need, they, they communicate to you information all along, what to expect, when to expect it, um, and they follow through. Um, that's a positive thing and you might say, I, even if I don't get the job, this is a great place and these are good people and I really like them and I would buy their product and I will tell my friends to apply for jobs here too, right? I mean, you, the spillover effect is your word of mouth becomes a very positive thing. Now, I, I said in the previous slide, you know, my experience, right, of, of, of how I was recruited here at SIUE and my experience here was so incredibly positive. I had a great experience. They treated me well. Um, I never wanted for anything. I loved everybody I met and I knew this was a place that I wanted to work. The day after I came back from my interview at SIUE, I went to interview at another school. Um, I had to drive three hours to get there. I showed up for the interview and they didn't offer me a bottle of water. They basically treated me like, just as it says here, that it was a privilege for, the, for me to be able to interview with them. That, you know, you know we're going to let you interview with us is if somehow they weren't trying to attract me or impress me as well. Um, so it was it was really quite disturbing uh, to contrast the two companies or the two schools and see how one treated me as if I was the person that they wanted and they really enjoyed my experience and then the other back to back you know, had an experience of, you know, you're so fortunate we let you interview with us and, and oh, did you want food? I know you drove three hours here, but we're not going to feed you. We're not going to give you anything to drink. Um, you know, they didn't even give me a glass of a bottle of water. I mean, it was ridiculous. So uh, I think you don't recognize you're being treated poorly until it is in contrast to an incredibly good experience. So I think that that's a really important for thing for you all to think about whether or not you're in HR or whether you're going on your own job interviews. Really look at how they treat you during the recruitment and selection process. If they treat you kindly and if they treat you fairly and if they treat you with transparency um, and they handle everything well, um, you know it's a good company and you know they care about details. But if they treat you lousy during the recruitment uh, and selection process, you, you can be guaranteed that that's the experience you're going to have when you're working for the company later on. Recruitment is an ongoing process that happens from the moment we decide that we need to fill a vacancy um, until that person signs on the, on the dotted line and becomes a part of the company. Um, and that person is considered part of the recruiting process until they tell you they're not interested. So this is important concept for the purpose of um, uh, data collection uh, for EEO things. 
a candidate is a candidate um, until they actually tell you they're no longer interested. So you have to continue them at continue, consider them as part of your pool unless they actively tell you to no longer consider them as part of the pool. So you have to recall remember that for the purpose of your flow statistics and your um, um, stock statistics and your um, hiring rates and things like that. Um, and so our goal, of course, is that we want to keep every possible qualified candidate um, to keep them interested in the job. If we don't do that, then we have wasted a ton of money to attract people who no longer want to stay in our process. So our goal is not only to attract them to be interested in the company, but also to stay in the process once they've made the application. So we need to make sure that every step of the way we treat them fairly with good information, that we are honest and upfront with them about what needs to be done. That's the only way you're going to keep people interested. Um, the recruiter's primary job is keeping people, garnering interest and keeping them interested in continuing in the selection process. So the more positive experience someone has up front with the company, the more likely they are to stay in the process. And then it's the aspects of the job more downstream that keep them interested in um, going for the, you know, staying as a candidate and applying for the position. So the recruiter's job, really important job, is, is sort of hooking people in and getting them interested and getting them um, uh, sort of committed to staying to the process. Um, and the organization's reputation is a big part of that. So if you've got a good reputation and a good recruiter, these things combined can really, really, really help. So um, your reputation can make a big difference in the recruiting process. That's why applicant reactions and spillover effects, all of these things are essential to pay attention to them. Because once your reputation starts to wane, that's going to make it that much more difficult for you to attract qualified people for your company. So given the important role of the recruiter in the recruiting process, um, there are a number of really important desirable characteristics that you want your recruiter to have. Not everybody is suited for recruiting because it's very much a marketing position. You're trying to sell someone on the company and not, not a used card salesman kind of sale, but uh, an important um, aspect of being honest and truth, truthful and um, transparent with your uh, applicants is really important. So what are some good characteristics? They have to be familiar with the job and the organization. Now, you might say to yourself, well, why can't I just send my recruiter from the HR department to go do the job? Well, the recruiter knows the job at a surface level. They don't, but even though they know the organization at a, at a deeper level, they're not as familiar with the job. So your HR recruiter can play a role in this, but they're more likely going to be able to sell the company and the company's benefits and the company's reputation, but they're not going to be able to sell the attributes of the job as well as the manager or an, a job incumbent, an employee who's actually doing the job. You also want to make sure that that recruiter has really good listening skills because they're listening not just for what the person is saying but also what the person may not be saying. Um, they, know, they know how to read between the lines, they know how to read the individual as they're talking to them to get a sense of whether or not this person would be good for the job. They uh, have good communication skills where they can be clear about what it is they're looking for, why they're looking for it, and so they're very good at uh, communicating verbals and nonverbals. Um, they have really good social skills. They are, um, uh, they're not introverts, or they could be, but they tend to, to be more outgoing, um, and, and extroverts tend to make better recruiters than introverts do. I mean, we do know this. But that doesn't mean that an introvert couldn't do a good job. They can be very um, uh, personable, good interacting on a one-on-one -on -one basis, um, and be able to be really good at the analytical side of things and to be able to determine who is going to be, um, you know, what are good recruiting sources and what are not. But they need, if nothing else, an introvert has to have good social skills. Um, so it's important that you recognize that. Intelligence and self-confidence are also very important because that recruiter has to be able to 
speak knowledgeably about the company and be confident in themselves and how they present themselves because that also sends a good message to the recruitee, you know, the applicant, that this is a company that, that, that hires smart people and, um, and, and they function as role models. Um, as I said, extroverts um, tend to be better at recruiting than introverts, but that doesn't mean an, an introvert could not be a good recruiter. Um, a person has to have enthusiasm about the job. You know, you need to have somebody that really loves the company, um, is enthusiastic about what the job entails and, and what it's like working for the company. So they are a cheerleader. They can realistically share good stories about the company and the job that the person will be doing. Um, they need to be trustworthy, which means they need to be able to be transparent in the information that they're, communi they're communicating and that they have to engender trust coming from the, um, the applicant. That's important. Uh, lastly is credibility. Um, they have to be credible. Now, the f one of the first comments I made as I was going through this list is about how who should recruit, whether it's the manager um, or the job incumbent or the HR professional. And as I said, sometimes the HR professional is really good at being able to sell the company. And they're credible with respect to what they can say about the company and the benefits and the salary range, um, what the culture's like, what the atmosphere is like, what you can generally expect working for that particular company. So the they may not have as much credibility talking about the specifics of the job. The person who has the most credibility talking about the specifics of the job is a job incumbent. It's somebody who actually does the job. So they may be the, the people, the lower level employees who are doing the jobs that you're recruiting for. They will come and they will share their experience and say, I like working for this company. I love this job. This is what the job entails. And um, I'm being, and that person is a credible um, uh, information source about what that job is about. The next most credible would, of course, be the boss, right? The, the person who is supervising the person who does that job. So if you are trying to recruit for a particular position, have the supervisor come and say, this is what I'm looking for in an employee. These are the kinds of things that I expect, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. That manager also becomes a credible source for what to expect to what it, that it takes to do that job. Um, so all of these are really important characteristics, um, and your recruiters need to be very good at this. So do not let somebody who's who is sort of flat affect or not enthusiastic or is a um, sort of a critical negative person be involved in your recruiting because they're gonna they're not going to be able to sell your company well. In terms of signaling. Oftentimes, things that people say or don't say in the interview, in the recruiting process, can signal things to the applicant. And, and you can't control how your applicants interpret those signals. Um, but they can send signals out about what is important or what is of value to the company. Again, if you don't treat people, treat people fairly and transparently, and kindly in the recruiting process, that signals how they will likely be treated when they work on the job. If people regularly show up late or are indifferent to people's schedules, um, again, that signals what the culture is like in the company. Pay attention to how you're treated during the recruitment process because everything that happens to you in that experience is just a microcosm of what's going to happen to you when you work in the larger company. Um, so. One of the things we, we, we tend to do as applicants is look to the recruiter, look to the recruitment materials that we use, look to how they treat us in that initial phase to figure out how, um, how we will be treated, to give us more information about how we're going to be treated at the company later on. So if the CEO is involved in recruiting, as it says there, that's an important signal that this is an important job and the CEO is involved and wants their hand in that, in that particular hiring decision. If you put a woman or a minority in the recruiting position, it's because you're trying to signal that diversity is important to the company. Um, so again, the even if you're not purposefully doing it, it is an unwritten message or an unspoken message um, that is being communicated to the applicants. And so think very clearly about what you do and what might be an unspoken message that you're communicating to your applicants. 
Recruiting behavior is essential to manage and understand because if you don't make a good first impression, it's going to be incredibly difficult to keep people interested in the company and interested in staying in the selection process to the end.